Witness, you were an SS man from 1933 on, were you not? Yeah. And during most of that time, you were connected with the SS legal system. Would a serious view have been taken in the Waffen-SS or the German army about the murder of Jews by SS men? Ich habe diese Frage nicht verstanden. I'll repeat it. Would a serious view have been taken in the Waffen-SS or the German army about the murder of Jews by SS men? Wenn die Tatsache der Judenvernichtung auf Befehl Hitlers in der SS oder, wie der Herr Anklagevertreter meint, in der Wehrmacht bekannt gewesen wäre, hätte man sich nach meiner Überzeugung sicher Gedanken gemacht. If an SS man had murdered 50 Jews, for instance, uh, would that have resulted in a death penalty being inflicted on him? Ich kann diese Frage mit einfachen Worten nicht beantworten, weil sie an ein Grundproblem rührt. Well, now, I want you to look at a document uh, dated September 1939, which shows the tolerance of murder in the SS by the highest judicial authorities of the German army. It is the document D421, will be GB567. page of the memorandum, the chief of the army judiciary announces by telephone, the field court-martial of the Kempf armored division has sentenced an SS man of the SS artillery regiment to three years imprisonment and a military police sergeant major to nine years penal servitude for manslaughter. After about 50 Jews who had been used during the day to repair a bridge had finished their work in the evening, these two men drove them all into a synagogue and shot them all without any reason. The sentence is submitted to the Commander-in-Chief of the Third Army for confirmation. The proposal of the representative of the prosecution is capital punishment for murder. And then there follow initials. And then there is a marginal note, General Halder requests information on the decision of the CNC of the Third Army. Purple pencil notes to the adjutant of the Commander-in-Chief of the Army. And uh, in the next page, you will see the course of this history. Telegram to the military judge of the fourth rank uh, attached to the Quartermaster General in Berlin. SS man Ernst is granted extenuating circumstances because he was induced to participate in the shooting by a corporal handing him a rifle. He was in a state of irritation owing to numerous atrocities committed by Poles against persons of German race. As an SS man, particularly sensitive at the sight of Jews to the hostile attitude of jury to the Germans, he therefore acted quite thoughtlessly in a youthful spirit of adventure. An excellent soldier, not punished before. And that is signed by the military judge of the third rank, Lipsky. And then there are purple pencil notes on the document to the adjutant of the CNC of the army. Lead pencil note. Telephone call from Oberkriegsgerichtsrat, Dr. Satman, to the effect that so far as has been ascertained, the CNC of the Army HQ will not confirm both sentences. Added in lead pencil, the sentences have been dropped under the amnesty 
Punishment was announced before the amnesty. Nine years penal servitude for this police sergeant major, changed to three years imprisonment, three years imprisonment for SS men, unchanged, confirmed by army headquarters. Now that was a clear countenancing of mass murder by the judicial authorities of the army, was it not? Dieses Dokument stellt nach meiner Auffassung in dem zweiten Teil dieser Aussage bezüglich der Begründung des milden Urteils gegen die beiden SS-Männer eine persönliche Ansicht des Kriegsgerichtsrat Lipski da, der dieses Urteil als Vorsitzender Richter verhängt hat. Ich bin daher nicht in der Lage, von hier aus, nachdem ich die anderen Aktenvorgänge nicht kenne, dazu Stellung zu nehmen, ob diese Gründe, die der Vorsitzende Richter hier angibt, von den Tatsachen abweichen oder nicht. Ich bemerke hierzu, zu diesem Dokument. But uh, just a moment. Do you appreciate that for the murder of 50 Jews, uh, and if the facts, uh, as reported in this German document, are true, it could have been nothing but murder, there was first of all a finding of manslaughter, you as a lawyer appreciate what I'm indicating, and secondly, that, is, that army judge passed a sentence of three years penal servitude for the murder of 50. He was one of your legal colleagues of the army, you know. And I suggest to you that this was typical of the attitude uh, of you, particularly in the SS, and the army the judicial authorities, to the murder of what you were pleased to call subhumans. Ich habe hierzu Folgendes zu bemerken. Es handelt sich zweifellos um die Rechtsfrage, ob diesem Urteil der rechtliche Tatbestand des Totschlags oder der Recht, rechtliche Tatbestand de, des Mordes zugrunde liegt. Welche tatsächlichen Gründe vorhanden gewesen sind, die den Richter veranlasst haben, hier lediglich Totschlag statt Mord anzunehmen, geht aus dem Dokument nicht hervor. Ich kann aus diesem Grund zu den Fragen des Herrn Anklägers keine Stellung nehmen. But you know, it's indicated perfectly clearly. The reason why it was reduced to manslaughter was that this man, Ernst, being an SS man, was particularly sensitive at the sight of Jews. And therefore, it was just a useful adventure. That's the, th that was operating in the judge's mind. You know, it's perfectly ja. clear. You ja, ich möchte hierzu Folgendes sagen. Es war, wie aus dem Dokument zu ersehen ist, der Antrag des Anklagevertreters vorhanden, wegen Mordes zu verurteilen, und zwar offensichtlich wegen Mordes die Todesstrafe zu verhängen. Jawohl. Der Vorsitzende Richter hat nicht die rechtliche Würdigung des Mordes seinem Urteil zugrunde gelegt, sondern die rechtliche Würdigung des Totschlags. Nach den deutschen Trat äh, Strafgesetzen well, uh, I, I... Ist, ist der Unterschied zwischen dem inneren Tatbestand des Totschlages und des Mordes darin gegeben, dass der Mord eine Handlung aus Überlegung mit dem Ziel der Tötung eines Menschen darstellt, der Totschlag eine Handlung aus dem Affekt heraus darstellt, der den Tod eines Menschen zur Folge hat. Diese letztere rechtliche Qualifikation hat der Richter dem Urteil zugrunde gelegt und die hier geschilderten Zustände dabei berücksichtigt. Witness, I'm obliged to you for your dissertation on the difference between manslaughter and murder. I think that uh, the tribunal is familiar with it. But at any rate, the end of this story was that the army commander-in-chief quashed the whole proceedings. Sentences were dropped under the amnesty. That was the end of, the, uh, of this pursuit of murder by the army judicial authorities. Con condemnation, amnesty, pardoning of the whole thing. I want, to, want you now to turn to another document. 
uh, so that the tribunal can judge how zealous the German authorities were in the pursuit of SS crimes. It is the document D926. It will be GB568. This again comes from an early period, not from the days when the Poles and the others whom you say were responsible uh, were operating. These are the pioneer days of the SS, 1933, when you joined them. This is a file relating to the deaths of prisoners in protective custody at the concentration camp of Dachau. Uh, it starts uh, with a letter dated the 2nd of June, 1933. From the Provincial Court Public Prosecutor uh, to the State Ministry of Justice. It's headed deaths of prisoners in protective custody at the concentration camp of Dachau. In accordance with my instructions, I had a lengthy discussion on the 1st of June, 1933, with Police Commander Himmler in his office at Police HQ Munich about the incident at the concentration camp of Dachau, which I have already reported to the Ministry of Justice separately. In particular, I told him briefly with the aid of photographs from the investigation files about the Schloss, Hausmann, Strauss and Nefske cases, of which he appeared to have been advised already. I pointed out that particularly the four above mentioned cases, in view of the result of the findings to date, offer good reason for cogent suspicion of serious punishable action on the part of the individual members of the camp guard and of camp officials and that both the public prosecution and the police, police authorities to whose knowledge these incidents have come are under the obligation, under the threat of heavy punishment, to carry out the criminal investigation of the above mentioned incidents without consideration for any persons whatsoever. I don't think I need trouble you with the rest of that document. Uh, document two, uh, is a letter from the Provincial Court Public Prosecutor of Munich to the State Ministry of Justice again. It's dated the 11th of August, 1933. So you see, witness, no action had apparently been taken from the 2nd of June uh, until the 11th of August. And then the Provincial Court Public Prosecutor, uh, the last sentence uh, of that letter, after referring to the dossiers relating to Schloss, Hausmann, Strauss, and Nefska, says, should the dossiers not be required at present, I would request the return of these files for the purpose of examining whether the decree of the 2nd of August, 1933, regarding the granting of immunity from punishment has to be applied. I didn't trouble you with the third document or the, f or the fourth. If the tribunal turns to page five of its copy, and if you witness turn to document eight, which is the next uh, I wish to refer to, uh, that is a, a, a report, again, from the provincial public prosecutor to the State Ministry of Justice. Death of the prisoner in protective custody, Hugo Hanshu. In, in Dachau camp. Have you found that uh, witness? Ja, ich habe es gefunden. The judicial autopsy ordered by me took place in Dachau on the 23rd of September 1933. It, I'm reading from page five of the English text. Now. It showed that death was due to a brain injury owing to hemorrhage in the soft membrane and that this hemorrhage was caused by blows of the blunt instrument which hit the skull, particularly in the region of the left temple and the back of the head. In addition, extensive bleeding was established in the corpse in the region of the left cheek, in the right shoulder and left upper arm regions, in the regions of the seat and the upper thigh and of the lower part of the left thigh. The results of blows on the body of the deceased were the blunt object during his lifetime. 
On the findings based on the post-mortem, the preliminary medical opinion gave grounds for assuming outside responsibility. I intend to continue the further necessary search for the perpetrators in collaboration with the political police. And uh, it's brought to the attention, as you see, of the uh, Prime Minister with a request to forward to the Reich Governor in Bavaria. And then there's a notice given to the State Minister of the Interior. Then document 11, page 9 of the English text, proposal made by the Minister of the Interior to quash the inquiry into the deaths of the protective custody prisoners Hanshu, Franz and Katz. Hanshu, you remember, witness, uh, was the subject of the autopsy, which indicated uh, outside responsibility. Now, this is um, uh, a letter uh, from Adolf Wagner to the, the defendant, Dr. Frank, the representative Nazi jurist, as he's been called. Uh, that is dated the 29th of November, 1933. What, Dr. Frank, is that? That's the, the defendant, Frank. Uh, the commander of the political police in the Ministry of the Interior presented to you on the 18th of November 1933 a proposal according to which the inquiry into the cases of the prisoners in protective custody Hugo Hanshu, Wilhelm Franz and Delvin Katz should be quashed for state political reasons. In connection with this case, you sent to me the liaison man of the State Ministry of Justice with the Bavarian Political Police Public Prosecutor, Dr. Stepp. Meanwhile, in a discussion with the commander of the Political Police, Reichsführer SS Himmler, I have ascertained once more that to carry out this inquiry would cause considerable damage to the reputation of the National Socialist State because this inquiry would be directed against members of the SA and SS. And thus the SA and the SS, as the main props of the National Socialist State, would be directly affected. For these reasons, I support the proposal for quashing the inquiry. Presented to you on the 18th of November by the commander of the political police in the State Ministry of the Interior. Uh, I don't think any trouble with the rest uh, of that letter. Although it states that the inhabitants of the concentration camp uh, could, are almost exclusively criminal types. The next document, document 10 in the German file. I don't know, uh, Mr. Owen Jones, the document you've just been reading from, which is on page 9 of the English copy, yes, my Lord. is dated the 29th of November 1933. Yes, my Lord. Is that a misprint? No, my lord, that, that, is, that is correct. Uh, the document on page 5, which you read before, from the public prosecutor, is dated the 26th of September, 1936. That, that is a misprint, my lord, that which I should have draw, drawn your lordship's attention to. That should be 1933? That should be 1933. I'm much obliged. Yeah. What page is that? Page 5. Page uh, perhaps, uh, whilst uh, we're referring to these dates, uh, I think you should uh, state that the um, pages that you were, didn't refer to, page three and page four, show uh, that the uh, other dossiers in connection with which the public prosecutor was making inquiry yes. were apparently lost or didn't, uh, weren't forthcoming. Yes, my lord. And that uh, inquiries were still going on about them until 1935. Yes, my lord. And they appear never to have been found. Yes, my lord. Much black. I'm trying to, to concentrate on uh, what appears yes, to me to be the essential but elements of this uh, revealing mem uh, file, my lord. Go on, then. Uh, I'm, I want to, you witness now to look at page uh, 6, at document 10 of your file, page 6 of the English copy. That is a, a, let, a memorandum from... Uh, Dr. Hans Frank, the defendant, dated the 2nd of December 1933 to the Prime Minister, subject quashing of criminal proceedings. A merchant's wife, Sophie Hanshu of Munich, in a written statement received by the public prosecution at the Provincial Court Munich II on the 18th September 1933, 
stated that her son Hugo Hanshu, taken into protective custody on the 23rd of August 1923, that should be 33, died of heart failure in Dachau camp on the 2nd of September 1933. In the inquest certificate, heart failure, followed on the, following on the concussion of the brain, was given as the cause of death. The body was not shown to the relatives and was handed over only after great difficulties and on condition that the coffin should not be reopened. The coffin was so firmly nailed down that it was impossible to reopen it. The writer asked that the coffin be opened and a judicial post-mortem held, as she wanted the body identified and the cause of death established. In order to clear up the state of affairs, the Provincial Court Public Prosecutor at the Provincial Court Munich II at first personally questioned the plaintiff, Sophie Hanschel, and the fiancé of the deceased, Thea Kink. From their evidence, the assumption seemed justified that already on the day of his arrest, Hanshu was badly physically treated in the Brown House in Munich. And in connection with the further established fact that the relatives of the dead man would expressly refuse permission to view the body, sufficient grounds were given for the suspicion that Hanshu did not die a natural death. In order to establish the cause of death without any doubts, the body was exhumed in Dachau on the 23rd of September 1933, and a judicial autopsy showed, uh, carried out on the orders of the Provincial Court Public Prosecutor. Uh, it, it showed that the death was caused by injury to the brain. As a result, hemorrhage of the soft membrane of the brain, and that these hemorrhages originated from blows of the blunt object, which hit the skull, particularly in the region of the left temple and that of the back of the head. And then there are further, follow further details of the autopsy, which, is, which have been given in another document I've read. The findings of the judicial autopsy gave grounds for assuming outside responsibility. Paragraph 2. In the forenoon of the 19th October, the public prosecution at the Provincial Court Munich, informed by telephone by the Bavarian political police, that in the afternoon of the 17th of October 1933, Wilhelm Franz of Munich, a prisoner in protective custody, born on the 5th June 1909, and on the night of the 17th, 18th of October 1933, Dr. Delvin Katz of Nuremberg, a prisoner in protective custody, born on the 3rd August 1887, hanged themselves in their military confinement cells in Dachau concentration camp. The public prosecution ordered the same morning a legal examination to be held in camp followed by a post-mortem. The corpses were in a locked camp shed lying on stretchers and with the exception of the feet were totally undressed. In Francis' cell, fresh blood spots and splashes were observed on the wooden plank bed. And then it goes on to say that a judicial autopsy was ordered on both corpses on the 20th of October 1933 and in the next paragraph there is the, the, the autopsy. The autopsy gave grounds suspecting in both corpses force by an outside hand. According to preliminary opinion of both law court doctors, provincial court doctor Flam and court doctor Niedenthal, death by suffocation as a result of strangulation and throttling was established in both cases. The strangulation marks found on the neck do not correspond to observations in the case of persons hanged. In respect of Francis' body, it is also stated in the preliminary opinion that fat embolism is not prima facie to be excluded as a contributing cause of death. Fresh wheels on the body, uh, fresh wheels on the head covered with hair, as well as particularly numerous ones on the body and on the arms, with extensive bleeding and destruction of fatty tissues was established, were established on this corpse. Apart from injuries on the neck, also Katz's body showed various signs of drying up and rubbing off of the skin of, off the head and one separation of the skin. At the time of the examination, the public prosecution had demanded the production of both belts with which France and Katz had allegedly hanged themselves. They could not be handed over at once. The Dachau lower court had ordered the confiscation of the belts in accordance with the application. Up till now, the objects confiscated had not yet been received by the public prosecution. And then paragraph three, in each case I informed the Prime Minister and through him the Reich Governor in Bavaria, as well as the State Minister of the Interior of the public prosecution's reports. In a letter of the 29th November 1933, addressed to me, 
the State Minister of the Interior proposed that for state political reasons, the inquiry pending at the public prosecution of the provincial court Munich II into the death of Hugo Hanschel, Wilhelm Franz, and Dr. Delvin Katz, prisoners in protective custody, should be quashed. As a reason, it is pointed out that the conducting of investigations would cause great harm to the prestige of the National Socialist State, since these proceedings would be directed against members of the SA and SS, and thus the SA and SS, as the chief protagonists of the National Socialist State, would be immediately affected. And then Frank goes on to give an opinion in law that the Reich governor, in fact, has the right uh, of pardoning. He states that uh, uh, the in the last part of the last paragraph but one, the constitutional deed of the Free State of Bavaria of 1919 forbade the quashing of criminal investigations. The law regarding the quashing of criminal investigations of the 2nd of August 1933 removed the ban on quashing. According to the Bavarian, Bavarian provincial law at present valid, the legal possibility therefore exists of quashing individual criminal proceedings by means of an administrative act in the form of a pardon. And then he states that this right is vested in the Reich governor for Bavaria. And then Frank suggests that in view of this legal position, the proposal of the State Minister of the Interior be submitted to the Council of Ministers. The next document, at page 10 of the English text, document 12 of the German text, indicates that the Council of Ministers uh, was not prepared to countenance the quashing. Page 10 of the English text, my lord. Uh, and uh, it states the proposal of the State Minister of the Interior that the inquiry pending at the public prosecution of the provincial court Munich into the deaths of the prisoners Hanschu, Franz and Katz was the subject of a debate during the meeting of the Council of Ministers of the 5th of December 1933. As a result, the State Minister of Justice communicated the following to the undersigned official. The criminal proceedings regarding the happenings in Dachau concentration camp are to be continued with all determination. The facts are to be cleared up with the utmost speed. And then there are various instructions uh, with regard uh, to the inquiry. The next stage of this story is the document 12 in the German file, page 11 of the English text, presented to the State Minister with a request that he take note. The note of the first public prosecutor, Dr. Stepp, regarding the carrying out of his instructions is attached with a request that note be taken. By order of Ministerial Councillor Derbig, I communicated to the Reichsführer SS Himmler the decision taken yesterday by the Council of Ministers concerning the cases of Hanshu, etc. The Reichsführer SS told me that the matter greatly concerned the Chief of Staff of the SA, Reich Minister Röhm. He, Himmler, had to discuss the matter with the latter first. Then Röhm gives certain instructions which this uh, uh, correspondent Dr. Sepp writes down from memory. The Dachau camp is a camp for prisoners who are in polit protective custody and who are imprisoned on political grounds. The incidents are concerned are of a political nature. And under all circumstances, the political authorities must decide first about them. To my mind, they are not suited to be dealt with by legal authorities. This is my opinion as chief of staff and also as a Reich minister who is interested in the Reich not suffering politically because of the proceedings in question. I shall get the Reichsführer SS to issue an order that no investigating authorities may enter the camp for the time being and that, pe that people in the camp may also not be interrogated for the time being. And then there's a note, the Court of Appeal Public Prosecution, Munich, was instructed by a directive from the minister to refrain, refrain for the time being from making an application for the opening of preliminary investigations. <coughs> And then uh, there follows in the next document, document 13, a letter to the public prosecution on the death of these men, Franz and Katz.
With regard to the above mentioned matter, I have as instructed requested the Bavarian political police to clear up the matter further in conjunction with the Commandant's office of the concentration camp of Dachau and to endeavor to find out the persons who are suspected of having been the culprits. In this requ request, I mentioned also that I have not yet received the legally confiscated instruments of suicide, belt and braces of the dead men. The political police have apparently transmitted the files without any written directions to the political department of the concentration camp of Dachau. And the first paragraph of the letter reads, the latest application for production of evidence from the public prosecution, Munich II, shows what far-fetched methods are employed in order to saddle the concentration camp of Dachau with allegedly perpetrated crimes. In the second paragraph of the letter, regret is expressed that the two dead men were able, by their suicide, to escape impending punishment for smuggling letters. The third paragraph refers to the confiscation and reads, after the two corpses had been dissected according to law, and had been released, the commandant staff had no further interest in the preservation of the instruments with which they hanged themselves. The commandant staff do not belong to those objectionable Kulturmenscher, cultured people, who preserved such articles as souvenirs as was done in America recently, in the Dillinger case. The letter is signed on behalf of the camp commandant by SS Obersturmbahnführer Lippert. Then there is a, a request by the public prosecution for action. Uh, in the next letter, there is a reference to this letter from the camp commandant uh, of Dachau, which shows that the request of, of the Oberstaatsanwalt arose from the impartial observance of his official duty. And then the file closes with this entry. Munich, the 27th September 1934, public prosecution, it's a letter from the Oberstaatsanwalt to the General Staatsanwalt at the Court of Appeal Munich, death of the prisoners in protective custody, Wilhelm Franz and Dr. Katz in the concentration camp of Dachau. I have stopped the proceedings as the investigations have not produced sufficient grounds for the assumption of outside guilt in the deaths of the two prisoners in protective custody. Well, now, witness, it's taken some time to read that document, but that is a characteristic illustration of the fact that the SA and SS abominations in the camps were protected by the highest authorities of the Third Reich. Is that not so? Ich muss zu diesem Dokument sagen, dass es aus dem Jahre 1933 stammt, zu einer Zeit, wo das Konzentrationslager Dachau nicht ausschließlich von SS-Angehörigen besetzt gewesen ist. Aus diesem Dokument ergibt sich, dass seitens der Staatsanwaltschaft des Landgerichts München der begründete Verdacht vorhanden ist, dass einige Schutzhäftlinge gemordet worden sind. Are you suggesting that conditions improved after the SS men took complete charge of running the camps? Ich möchte dazu sagen, dass das Einzelfälle aus dem Jahre 1933 sind, die dieses Dokument beinhaltet, dass aus diesem Dokument aber nicht auf allgemeine Zustände in den Konzentrationslagern vor allem in den kommenden Jahren geschlossen werden kann. D did you know that the Waffen SS was making quite a profitable business out of killing people in concentration camps? Did you know that? Ich muss I want Did you know that? Nein. I want you to look at the document D960. It shall be exhibit GB568. It's a very short document, this one. 
<laughs> it is from, it is headed Waffen SS Natzweiler Concentration Camp, Commandant's Office, 24th March 1943, Concentration Camp Natzweiler. Bill, to the Security Police and SD Strasbourg, for the 20 prisoners executed and cremated in this concentration camp, costs amounting to 127 Reichsmarks, 5 Pfennigs arose. The Commandant's Office of the Natzweiler Concentration Camp requests the early dispatch of the above-mentioned sum. The tariff for, for killing was very low in, in Natzweiler, wasn't it? Six marks, 38 pfennigs for each dead man. Did you know that monies were being paid to the funds of the SS for, for activities of that kind? Nein, das geht nach meiner Auffassung aus dem Dokument auch gar nicht hervor. Die Konzentrationslagerkommandantur bezeichnet sich hier mit dem Dienststellenwaff äh, Dienststellenstempel Waffen-SS. Ich muss dabei auf das verweisen, was ich gestern gesagt habe. Dass der Be die Bezeichnung Waffen-SS insofern irrig ist, als das Konzentrationslagerwesen eine selbstständige polizeiliche Einrichtung war. Dieses Dokument scheint mir insofern meine Behauptungen zu unterstützen, als daraus hervorgeht, dass auch diese scheußliche Rechnung hier an die Sicherheitspolizei gerichtet ist. Also wieder an ein Exekutivorgan. Waffen and where, just, just a moment. Assuming that the security police paid this bill, where would the money have gone to? <coughs> to have gone back to Natzweiler, what would have happened to it? Would it have been credited to the funds of the Waffen SS or not? Die Kommandanturen der Konzentrationslager zu denen auch Natzweiler gehört, haben ihre Abrechnung mit dem Reich getätigt und nicht mit der Waffen-SS. Ich kann dazu, wie dieses Geld verwendet worden ist und für welche Zwecke es ausgegeben war, keine Stellung nehmen. You have, no, you have no knowledge of the financial arrangements of these camps vis-à-vis -vis the Waffen-SS, have you? If you haven't, that suffices for me for the moment. Nein, nein, ich weiß aus meiner Tätigkeit im Hauptamt des Essgerichts auch einiges über die wirtschaftliche Unterstellung der Konzentrationslager. Und das, was diesen Punkt hier betrifft, weiß ich, nämlich, dass die Kommandanturen der Konzentrationslager ihre Kostenabrechnung direkt mit den Dienststellen des Deutschen Reiches vornahmen, nicht etwa verknüpft gewesen sind mit anderen Kassen oder Dienststellen der eigentlichen Waffen-SS. If you please, now you said in your testimony that the guards in concentration camps uh, had not committed crimes, that whoever else was responsible, Pearl and one or two others, certainly it wasn't the SS guards. Were you serious when you said that with this? Um einen Irrtum zu vermeiden, Herr Ankläger, möchte ich hier richtigstellen, dass mit Wachmannschaften im Sinne meiner Ausführungen ausschließlich diejenigen Personen gemeint sind, die ein Konzentrationslager von außen her bewachen. Im Gegensatz zu den Angehörigen der Konzentrationslager, die in den Kommandanturen und Kommandanturstäben vorhanden sind, die also den internen Betrieb der Lager bewachen. But, uh, but both, uh, 
Both, both those categories of guards were SS men, weren't they? Wie ich bereits gesagt habe, gehörten sie zu der sogenannten nominellen Waffen-SS, ohne mit dieser organisch etwas zu tun zu haben. Well, I, sh I, I shall return to that uh, point in a moment. Uh, first of all, I want you to look at the document D924. It will give you a picture uh, of the uh, humanity and ethical attitude of SS guards. I'm using a phrase which you used yourself vis-à-vis -vis the SS. It's GB 570, my lord. It's a report this time from a Dutch source of the evacuation of the Remsdorf camp to Theresienstadt. Uh, the first page is a statement by Peter Langhorst, uh, who says, I'm an ex-political prisoner and I have been detained in various prisons and concentration camps, finally in the Remsdorf camp. At the approach of the Allied armies, this camp was evacuated and the prisoners, about 2,900 men, were put on transport from Remsdorf to Theresienstadt. Mostly these prisoners were Czechs, Poles, Russians, Hungarian Jews, while there were only a few Dutchmen among them. Of these prisoners, only some 500 men actually reached Theresienstadt, the others were simply killed off during the transport by the so-called shot in the neck. The corpses were thrown into mass graves, which were filled up afterwards. Then, I needn't trouble you with the rest of the statement, but you'll see a further statement with regard to that matter by Baron von Landswerder of Amsterdam, who was on this uh, transport, uh, who says that the end of the second paragraph, on the 12th of November 1944, I was imprisoned in the concentration camp Remsdorf, where I stayed until my escape on the 20th of April 1945. At the approach of the Allied forces, the camp at Remsdorf was evacuated in great haste, and the political prisoners of this camp were transported to the Camp Theresienstadt. At first, the prisoners were transported by train and in goods vans. We arrived by train at Marienbad, where, for causes I do not know, we had a delay of about one week. The vans with the prisoners were kept standing at the station. In the course of that week, Allied bombers attacked the Marienbad station, and in the confusion, some thousand prisoners escaped into the surrounding woods. Naturally, the entire local service, the SS, Volkssturm and Hitler Jugend, were set to work to recapture the escaped prisoners. And practically all prisoners who, of course, wore their camp clothes and could easily be recognized were recaptured. These prisoners, about a thousand men, were led back in groups to Marienbad Station. And there they were killed by the SS guards by a shot in the neck. As both engines of the train had been wrecked during the air attack, the prisoners had to walk all the way from Marienbad to Theresienstadt. Many among them were unable to go so far and fell down along the road totally exhausted. Without exception, these prisoners were murdered by the guards by a shot in the neck. That evening, their bodies were removed by lorry and buried in mass graves in the woods. And he says he thinks he could identify uh, where it was. I am fully prepared to assist in tracing them. When the transport started, I heard the SS guards saying that the total number of prisoners amounted to 2,775. Only some of these prisoners have reached Theresienstadt. The others were murdered during the transport. Near Lobositz, about seven kilometers, kilometers from Theresienstadt, I myself escaped. The leader of the transport was the SS Oberscharführer Schmidt, one of the henchmen of Buchenwald, who also behaved in a most scandalous way towards the prisoners and who was known to be a sadist. Do you still say that the SS guards betrayed the characteristics of decency?
Ich möchte betonen, dass ich von den SS-Wachmannschaften nicht behauptet habe, dass sie die charakteristischen Eigenschaften der SS-Angehörigen besäßen. Ich habe gesagt, dass unsere er Untersuchungen ergeben haben, dass der Verbrechenskomplex in den Konzentrationslagern von den Angehörigen der Kommandanturen begangen war und dass wir keinen Nachweis dafür gefunden haben, dass die Bewachungsmannschaften beteiligt waren. Hier Now, let, me show you, let me show you another document, the document D959. It will be GB571, which is a report of the Ministry of the Interior of the Czechoslovak Republic. I want you to... I want you to turn to page three of the report. Crimes committed by the members of the Algemeiner SS and the Waffen SS. Witness, have you any knowledge of the part played by SS units in the arrest and ill treatment of the students of Prague in November the 17th, 1939? Nein, über diesen Fragenkomplex kann ich nicht aussagen weil mir die Tatsache der Teilnahme hier das erste Mal bekannt wird. You had no knowledge of the participation of the 6th SS Totenkopf Standarte in that matter, did you? I'm referring to an entry... Nein, hatte ich nicht. I'm referring, my lord, to an entry in a previous Czechoslovak report, USSR 60. You say you had no knowledge of that. Uh, this report... Nein, ich hatte keine Kenntnis. This report refers further to reprisal measures against civilians suspected of contact with the partisans in which the SS took part. Did you have any knowledge? Do you have any knowledge of SS troops taking part in reprisal measures against civilians? Ich kann insofern darüber aussagen, als mir bekannt ist, in welcher Art und Weise die Waffen SS eingesetzt war. Ich weiß, dass die Waffen-SS, und nur um die kann es sich hier handeln, an der Front kämpfte. I just want you to look at the last paragraph but one in paragraph two, page four of the exhibit D959. Page four, the par it's the fourth paragraph down in the English text. On May the 5th, 1945, after having plundered the village of Javorisko in the district of Litovel, the SS burnt it down. During this execution, the SS troops shot in the nape of the neck or killed in the burn burning houses all the male inhabitants of the village from the age of 15 to 17 years. Women with children, after having been ill-treated, were driven away. The execution at which 38 men lost their lives took place because the inhabitants of the village were suspected of hiding partisans. Have you any knowledge of that action or of actions of that kind that the SS took part in? Nein, solche Handlungen sind mir nicht bekannt geworden. Offensichtlich handelt es sich hier um den letzten Kampf um Prag. So then I want you to turn to some further evidence about the ill treatment by SS guards of transports of prisoners from concentration camps. Uh, the fifth paragraph on page five of the report refers to 
312 persons being beaten to death or shot or died, their body, body is buried in a coal pit and you'll see that it's stated that the, the beatings and killings were done by SS guards. That's very much like the Dutch report, is it not? And then there follows in the last section, crimes committed during the Prague Revolution in May 1945, further accounts of SS atrocities. Now, witness, I want you to look at a new document, D878, which will be GB572, which is a report from the statistical, the Scientific Statistical Institute of the Reichsführer SS on the composition of the SS. I want you to look, if you will, at the third page of the photostat, the page marked page one. That sets out the, I, I'm sorry, my lord, I haven't a translation of this, but I think that the entries will speak for themselves are quite clear. Uh, that is headed total strength of the SS on the, as on the 30th of June, 1944. You will see it, see it shows Algemeiner SS, ex, and the translation, I think, is excluding those members who at the moment are serving as reserves of the Waffen SS. Nicht einberufen, not called up, 66,614. 64,000. Uh, 64,000. Called up to the Wehrmacht, 115,908. Called up to the Labour Front, 722, in miscellaneous duties, 19,254. Total of 200,498 of the Allgemeine SS. Now, can you tell the tribunal whether those not called up among the 64,000 odd were performing police duties, or were some of those performing police duties? Nach meiner Auffassung muss es sich bei den Zahlen, die hier in diesem Dokument angegeben sind, um die Angehörigen der allgemeinen SS handeln, die weder einberufen waren, noch sonstige Tätigkeiten ausübten, also in der Heimat ihrem Zivilberuf, das heißt, ihrem wirtschaftlichen Einsatz und so weiter nachgingen. The, the, the last category of 19,254 on miscellaneous duties were those the people who were forming the personnel of the Einsatzkommandos? Das ist vollkommen ausgeschlossen, denn Das Personal der Einsatzkommandos bestand nur aus wenigen hundert Mann. Es muss unter dem Begriff des sonstigen Einsatzes hier irgendeine andere Funktion gemeint sein, die ich im Augenblick nicht übersehen kann. Well, now, you'll see that that page shows the total in the Waffen-SS of 594,443. Now I want you to turn to page 24 of this report. Uh, Mr. Erwin Jones, what's the final total described as? The, the total, SS total, 794,941. Yes, but what's the second German word there mean? Insgesamt. Okay. Altogether, I see. If you turn to page 24, you will see that the, that total of members of the Waffen-SS of 594,443 is divided up into various categories. There are first the Feldtruppenteiler, which are field units, 368,654. Then the next is, I understand, recruiting staff, 21,365. 
The next category, training and reserve, 127,643. Then schools, 10,822. Then other units and offices directly subordinate to SS leadership head office, 26,544. And then in the head office, 39,415, making the grand total of 594,443. Now, the, that entry of other un, of 26,544 other units and offices directly subordinate to SS leadership head office, who were those men? Did they provide the personnel of the Einsatz commanders? Ich muss meine Antwort von gerade eben wiederholen. Um das Personal der Einsatzkommandos kann es sich bei dieser Zahl unter keinen Umständen handeln, weil das Personal der Einsatzkommandos mit der SS an sich nichts zu tun hatte, sondern von den Dienststellen der Exekutive, vor allem auch von der Polizei gestellt wurden. Diese Zahl von 26.544 SS-Angehörigen müssen Angehörige von Dienststellen und Einheiten gewesen sein, die sich nicht in den Hauptämtern befanden, andererseits auch nicht an der Front kämpften, sondern sich im Reichsgebiet bei irgendwelchen Now witness, will you next turn to page 28 of this document? which shows how the 39,415 described on page 24 as being members of the head offices of the Waffen SS are employed. It starts SS head office 9,349. Waffen SS men engaged on in the SS Economic Admin and Administration Head Office. Uh, I beg your pardon, the second one. Waffen SS men engaged in the RIS and Resettlement Office of the SS 2689. That was the office headed by Himmler, which yesterday you'd said you said had nothing to do with the SS, with the Waffen SS at all. And then third is the SS Economic and Administration Head Office, WVHA, that is, is it not? 24,091 Waffen SS men. Personal staff of the Reichsführer SS, 673. SS Personnel Head Office, 170. Head Office SS Law Courts, 599. Office of the SS Obergruppenführer Heismeyer, 553. Reich Commissioner for Consolidation of German Folkdom, 304. Reich Commissioner for the Consolidation... Reich Commissioner for the Consolidation of German Folkdom, the Volksdeutsche Mittelsteller Office, 987, making a total of 39,415. Now, that makes it clear, does it not, that Waffen SS men were engaged in all this hideous network of Himmler's machinery of terror, wasn't it? Ich glaube nicht, dass das daraus hervorgeht. Ich habe gestern ausführlich dargestellt, dass die einzelnen Hauptämter kein einheitliches Oberkommando darstellten. Wenn hier zum Beispiel bei den verschiedenen Hauptämtern Angehörige der Waffen-SS erscheinen, 
so ist das darauf zurückzuführen, dass die dort diensttunten Personen in das Wehrverhältnis der Waffen-SS während des Krieges einberufen wurden, weil dadurch ihre UK-Stellung nicht notwendig wurde und sie so dem Zugriff der Wehrmacht entzogen werden konnten. Das all, those, das all those men were carried on the strength of the Waffen-SS, they, they were members of the Waffen-SS, they wore Waffen-SS uniforms and were paid by the Waffen-SS. That is so, is it not? Das ist wohl so. Das hat aber insofern eine andere Bedeutung, als sie damit nicht Mitglieder der Organisation, der gewachsenen Organisation waren, sondern, wie das im Krieg vielfach der Fall war, einfach die Uniform angezogen bekamen und dementsprechend besoldet wurden. Wenn ich aus diesem Dokument Seite 28 beispielsweise das SS-Wirtschafts- und Verwaltungshauptamt nehme mit 24.091 angeb angeblichen Waffen-SS-Angehörigen, so muss ich hierzu sagen, dass es sich hier wohl ausschließlich um die Konzentrationslagerbewachungsmannschaften handeln kann und hieraus eben hervorgeht, dass diese Mannschaften als sogenannte nominelle Waffen-SS eben dem Wirtschafts- und Verwaltungshauptamt angehängt waren, aber mit der Waffen-SS in Wirklichkeit nichts zu tun hatten. If your Lordship pleases, I submit the document speaks for itself and I have no further questions.